Hello everyone, my name is Erin Lomax. I am the Education Specialist at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit at the St. Lucie County Aquarium in Fort Pierce, Florida. Today we're going to be exploring seagrass ecosystems. There are a couple of activities for this module that you can find right below this video. All of the materials that you need to complete this module are included, and this module can be done completely from home. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to the education team. Our contact information will be at the end of this video. So there are two separate activities for this module depending on your grade level. So this module is going to be best for grades third through fifth and also sixth through eighth. So each of those groups will have their own activity. We'll start with a short video overview. The grade appropriate activities, as I said, can be found right below the video. Once you're finished, you can check your answers with the answer key in this module. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about seagrass. So what is seagrass? And where is it found? Well, seagrass is a flowering plant. It grows completely submerged in water, and it's found in shallow, salty, and brackish water all over the world, from the tropics to the Arctic. So brackish water is water that's not quite as salty as ocean water, but it's not fresh water either. It's kind of in between salt water and fresh water. And this map that we have right here is from the Smithsonian Institution, and the green areas show you where seagrasses are found around the world. The species key will also show uh, approximately how many species are found in each of those areas as well. There are 72 species of seagrasses that are found worldwide. So the word seagrass is a little bit of a misnomer because seagrass isn't really a grass in the traditional sense. It's called seagrass because it's got those grass-like leaves. It's kind of similar to the grass that might be growing on your front lawn, kind of looks like that. But remember, these are flowering plants. So uh, we have a picture of a seagrass flower here on the right, and that's kind of the main difference. So a lot of people have trouble distinguishing between seagrass and seaweed. Some people think it's the same thing, but it's not. Those are two separate things. Seagrasses are vascular plants, which means they have specialized tissues to move water and minerals throughout the plant. And uh, seaweed is algae. It doesn't have any vascular tissue. And seagrasses also have leaves, they have stems, and they have a root system. So Algae does, uh, does not have that, uh, that root system. There are some seaweed that, uh, that have a hold fast, which is something that helps them hang on to something, but it's not really a root system like what seagrasses have. Now, because we're gonna be talking about seagrasses that are in our own backyard in the Indian River Lagoon, let's talk a little bit about the Indian River Lagoon. So the Indian River Lagoon runs for 156 miles down the east coast of Florida, starts at uh, the Ponce de Leon Inlet in New Smyrna Beach, goes all the way down to the Jupiter Inlet in northern Palm Beach County, and it encompasses three different bodies of water, the uh, Banana River, the Mosquito Lagoon, and the Indian River. Now, a lot of people ask us, what is a lagoon? So a lagoon is a salty body of water. It's separated from the ocean by a natural barrier. In our case, it is the islands that run down the uh, east coast of Florida, including Hutchinson Island, which is where the St. Lucie County Aquarium is located. Now, it's a shallow body of water. The average depth is about four to six feet. So that's why we get so many seagrass beds and so many different species of seagrasses growing in our lagoon because we've got that shallow body of water there. We actually have seven species of seagrass that grow in the lagoon. Now some of these seagrasses are much more prevalent, they're much more common than others. So for instance, the turtle grass and the manatee grass uh, are fairly prevalent uh, as opposed to something like Johnson's grass, which is only found in southeast Florida and Cool fact, it was the very first marine plant to be listed on the endangered species list. So why are seagrasses so important? Well, there's a few different reasons. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about how they are nursery habitats. So uh, the, uh, the juveniles of many animals, including this little baby snapper fish up here and this little baby spiny lobster, uh, spend a portion of their young lives 
in the seagrass beds. And these are animals that a lot of times will be much larger someday. They'll go out to a little bit deeper water uh, when they're bigger. But when they're in the seagrass beds, a lot of times those are babies. The seagrasses provide shelter and food for the organisms that live there. But that doesn't mean that we only find small animals in seagrass beds, okay? You've probably seen uh, pictures of manatees eating seagrass. We have a lot of manatees in the Indian River Lagoon. And that's because seagrass is what those guys eat. So manatees need to eat up to 10% of their body weight every single day in seagrass. Now an average adult manatee weighs between a thousand and twelve hundred pounds so they can be eating up to a hundred pounds of seagrass or more every single day. There are also some sea turtles like this little green sea turtle right here that will also eat seagrass. Now sea, sea turtles don't lay their eggs on the beaches of the lagoon. However, they will enter the lagoon in search of food and rest. So they kind of come in to rest and relax a little bit and then they'll go back out into the ocean. We also find animals like sharks and dolphins. Uh, we find crustaceans. We'll even find sponges and mollusks in seagrass beds as well. So there's many, many different species that make use of seagrass beds. Now, like all plants, seagrasses photosynthesize. So they produce food from the sun and then they release oxygen back into the water. In fact, some of the air that we breathe on land actually comes from seagrasses. So one square meter of seagrass can produce about 10 liters of oxygen every day. Now I've got a cool video I want to show you here. This is actually from our seagrass ecosystem exhibit at the aquarium uh, where we have a living seagrass ecosystem. And you can see this little chain of oxygen bubbles here is being produced by the blade of seagrass. It's actually coming out of the end of that blade of seagrass. So when the water becomes saturated with oxygen, when it's not able to absorb any more oxygen, those bubbles rise to the surface and they'll release the oxygen into the air. Now because seagrasses have root systems, they also help to prevent erosion. So the uh, root system helps to anchor the sand in place around them. And like other plants, they also remove carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. So let's talk a little bit about uh, seagrass food webs. We mentioned it before because seagrasses are a food source for animals like manatees and sea turtles. Uh, but there is another type of plant that grows on a blade of seagrass that is called an epiphyte. So if you can see inside that black circle, the uh, kind of brown fuzzy stuff is actually a type of algae. And there are many small organisms that will feed on those epiphytes. So that might be small invertebrates. Uh, so it might be snails and little shrimp, but it could also be fish mullet will uh, will happily eat epiphytes as well and these epiphytes are primary producers in this habitat which in very simple terms means that they are the base of this particular food web and they're creating the energy or the food from photosynthesis and then they are fed on by other organisms in that habitat so dead seagrass can also be food for organisms that eat decomposing material, but remember how I said that seagrass beds are nursery habitats, right? So there might be very small animals in that habitat, and then perhaps a little bit larger organism might feed on that very small organism. And then in turn, there might be larger predators that come into the seagrass beds. That would be like sharks or dolphins or even larger fish like that guy that then prey on those uh, smaller animals. And then in turn, we might be a part of that food web as well. So we might eat some of the larger fish that have fed on organisms in the, uh, in the seagrass beds or they spent part of their lives in the seagrass beds. Now there are threats to seagrass uh, and seagrasses are sensitive to heavy wave or wind action like during natural events like hurricanes but they'll typically rebound quickly once conditions return to normal levels. But most of the threats that seagrasses face are human caused. So one of those is called prop scarring. So what that is uh, is when propellers from boats 
disturb and kill the seagrass in an area and they leave something behind called scarring which is those lines that you can see running through the seagrass bed in that photo right there that's the area where the propeller disturbed that area and killed some of the seagrass and there are some other human-made threats like like overfishing however a big threat that we've seen really heavily impact the Indian River Lagoon is called runoff so runoff is when water from the land that contains pollutants so it might contain oil from roadways it might contain trash it might even contain something like waste from your dog if you didn't pick up after your dog uh, and it might contain fertilizer as well from lawns or from golf courses and all of that eventually flows into a body of water and that's what we mean when we say runoff so I've got a photo here that I want to show you so the darker colored water is runoff so it's full of pollutants and it's making its way through the Indian River Lagoon and it's kind of uh, it's kind of making its way over to that nice blue water right there on the edge now the nitrogen and phosphorus in fertilizers can cause harmful algal blooms in the lagoon and those harmful algal blooms have been responsible for the loss of many thousands of acres of seagrass over the past few decades and what that looks like is kind of almost like green slime on the top of the water. Now we talked a little bit about algae before as it's being a very important food source for a lot of animals. Well, there's different types of algae and this particular type of algae in enough abundance causes very serious problems for seagrasses in particular because the algae grows on the surface of the water, blocks out the sun, and the seagrasses are not able to photosynthesize and so they die and when the seagrasses die think about all of the organisms that depend on that seagrass that we just went through with the food web so there's a lot of negative effects from seagrasses dying but there is a way we can track changes in seagrasses over time so that we as a species as humans can make better choices to keep our seagrass beds healthy one of the ways that we do that is through monitoring so monitoring is a repeated observation of a specific area over time and there are researchers who monitor seagrass beds over time to detect changes in the amount of seagrass in an area and because seagrasses are so important to our environment it's really important to understand their health and we can understand how healthy the seagrass is by measuring the amount of seagrasses in that area so if there's a lot of seagrass we could say that the seagrass population is healthy but if a lot of the seagrass dies off over time we might know that there's a problem with the water quality or with human pollution in that area and if there's less seagrass coverage we know that the species that depend on the seagrass may also be in trouble so to determine how and if the amount of seagrass in an area is changing over time whether there's less seagrass or more seagrass researchers use something called a quadrat which is basically just a lightweight frame made out of plastic PVC pipes put over the uh, seagrass and from there the researchers can calculate the amount of seagrass coverage inside the frame and the number of species that they're able to observe from that information researchers are able to make broader estimates of seagrass coverage in an area so they'll go back to the same area over and over and over again to record how the amount the amount of seagrass changes over time and there are actually some researchers at the Smithsonian Marine Station who participate in seagrass monitoring as well some of those researchers are part of an observation network called Marine Geo and uh, I encourage you to do a little web search on Marine Geo and read about some of the work that they're doing because it's pretty cool okay now that we know a little bit about seagrass ecosystems it is your turn as I said in the beginning there are two different activities for this module for third through fifth grade you will be putting together a seagrass food web so you'll have a list of organisms that live in 
and depend on seagrass beds. You're going to put them together in your own food web and then you're going to check your answers with the answer key. For 6th through 8th graders, you're going to take on the role of a marine science researcher studying the amount of seagrass coverage in an area. So you'll use the illustrated transect, which is included in the, uh, in the module, to calculate the percentage of coverage and the number of seagrass species that you're finding. And again, when you're finished, check your answers with the answer key. If you do have any questions, uh, please contact us at the aquarium. The best way to get a hold of us is through email. Our email address is smseducation at si.edu. Thank you guys so much and have a great day.